Welcome to Women at Halftime podcast, but not just for women, for you men too. If you're at mid-career or the halftime of life, our inspirational topics are not only fun, but also meant to help you maximize and write your next chapter. Right here with me, Deborah Johnson. Well, hello, everyone. I'm so excited to have a guest today. And I was on Angie's, uh, actually recorded on her podcast, and now we get to reverse uh, record here. Uh, so she will be my guest. Uh, absolutely delightful. I didn't know if we could ever end our conversation. It's so great to have you here, Angie. I'm excited so. for this because I felt the same way that it was like, uh, I just felt like we had so much more to talk about. So yeah. I'm excited yeah. to continue and see where this goes. Yeah, yeah, we'll have fun. <laughs> I do have, a, we'll guide it a little bit here, but uh, we have that emphasis of helping people um, at mid-career, at halftime of life. That's really where I emphasize on my work and helping people move ahead, answering the questions of what's next. Uh, many people are asking, you know, they're looking for meaning in life and direction and all of that at this point, especially, you know, uh, especially for those women who's raised families or they've worked at the same time, but they're just they're wanting to do a little something different, men and women usually. So uh, I do very little private coaching, but I do a lot of online work and I love this format with podcasts as well. So, um, Angie, thanks so much. Uh, for joining us. This is just a thrill. Um, and I'm so excited because you've you know, you've done a lot of content, put there uh, up a lot of content. You can see mine in back of me, all my books and all that sort of stuff. So I want you, I like to have my guest um, give us, you know, just a very brief background because you have an interesting background of your your work and what led you to be uh, where you are now. Yeah. And uh, there's, there's a lot of different, well, that could get very long and there's multiple different Reader's Digest versions of it. But I think what's interesting about just in the context of what you do, and I know who's listening, is that I've gone through that one, just what I do now in that career coaching space. I talk to a lot of people who are at a halftime. And I think what's interesting, I've had a couple quarter times, let's say, through my through my uh kind of professional and adult life. The 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 short journey is I started my career as an engineer. And I knew in college, it was not what I wanted to do. But when you go to engineering school at Carnegie Mellon, you don't change your major when you're a junior. So I stuck it out and realized about seven or eight years in my career, it was time to change. So I uh, jumped off the precipice without a safety net and just changed careers without very much of a plan in the middle of the Great Recession in like 09, 10. And I think that has shaped a lot of my perspective on kind of how these things go now. And at that point, it was really wanting to look look for something that was more aligned with how I, how I wanted to work, uh, and more being more creative, communicative than engineering could, could provide stumbled into the nonprofit sector where I was at for another seven ish years. That seems to be a common theme. Seven years seems to be my itch. Huh? Funny. <laughs> how about that? Uh, and then, and then coming out of that is where I really, I had really uh, figured out the entrepreneurial tendencies that I had never really understood before. And so coming out of that, I knew I was ready to start a business. That's where I was at my, I, I want to have impact and, and kind of an intentional step that I now see so many people having. And that's when career benders was born five and a half years ago. Wow. Wow. Well, you've come a long way in that as well. And I loved your word your that you used intentional. And I'm big on using that word because uh, it takes a while for people to get to that point. But when when you do, making that choice and then taking those steps is, is just really very, very important. So um, and I, I wanted to ask the question also, as you made that change, was there ever a time you were thinking, what was I thinking? You know, that's sometimes, you know, I think of, okay, I've started all of this and I've got all this product. I've got all of this. What was I thinking? Did I ever think I'd have to manage this much? Oh, so there have been lots of, what was I thinking moments <laughs> in the last 20 years of adulthood? I, the first one was, uh, and, and I'm going to wrap this into that intentional thing. Cause that tends to be the, the common word that whether right. it's more meaning, more money, more values aligned culture, whatever that driver is, it's, it's, a, I find that the halftime plight really is answered by an intentional solution to find the thing that resolves what's missing. 
And for me, that's kind of where these little what ifs came in or these like, what am I thinking came, came in because I was like in search of something. So one of those happened. I'm, I, uh, after college moved to Boston, which is where I started my career and I learned how to ski. Uh, so I got bit by the outdoor bug and came to Colorado to ski here and was like, why am I driving I-95 to Maine to go skiing every weekend when I could just live here? So I moved and wow. I got to transfer through the company I worked for, but I grew up in a small, a small place, small town. I would say a uh, small world because of that small town. So that was totally a, what am I thinking? I'm moving across basically by all comparison, moving across the world. So that was one. And, and just like not knowing anybody and making the move. So that was like a, what am I thinking? But it, it totally worked out. Same with, okay, I'm going to leave this engineering career, which had some stability during the great recession. And I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to go run an art gallery. What am I thinking? Because that's what I did. I left a 10,000 person worldwide engineering firm to go run a single artist gallery. That is an entirely different episode, Deborah. Oh my goodness. You know, I've been into creative arts and that's that's interesting. The, you know? Engineer and artist, oil, water. There's there's your title. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, I'll be honest, as an entrepreneur, and I am extremely passionate about entrepreneurship. I consider myself an entrepreneur first and a coach second which I think we're going to probably get into. Yeah, I love and, that. and that's that spark that I finally figured out that all the pieces started to fall into place. All the stuff made sense. But even in five and a half years in, in business and having a very consistent business, there are still, what am I thinking days? You yeah. know what I mean? From in all, like, what am I thinking? Who am I to coach this executive in their career, even though I've been an executive? Like it's, it's all these different thoughts that come into play, especially we women are good at questioning those kinds of things. So yeah, there are what, what was I thinking? Who am I moments that I still can can continue to experience them. Yeah. And this imposter syndrome that's so huge right now, there's books and everything coming out about it. And I, inter I interviewed uh, one of those authors, but um, you, every, we ask those, it doesn't matter what level you're at. Yeah. Those thoughts come in. I mean, the beautiful models and the beautiful everything, you know, that they're uh, or at the very top, the actresses, they're still going, yeah, can I just do, you know, do this? And um, there's those thoughts when they're honest. And, the, like, you know, if you can if you can work through them. Yeah. That's when re like really good growth and confidence building comes through that, because I mean, we love the outdoors. We adventure. I get dragged on all kinds of things. And I trust me, there are times when I'm like, what am I thinking right now? Why yeah. am I doing this thing? But once you conquer it, you conquer the fear and you prove to yourself that you're going to live through the, what am I thinking? You, you Then the next, what am I thinking? Doesn't seem so severe either. So I think that that's also that one of the tricky things about imposter syndrome, and you're hundred percent right, very trending, rightly yes. so kind of mm -hmm. systemic issue right now. One of the ironic things about it and challenging things about it is the only way to work through it is to work through it and to yes. act through it. Yeah. And, and that can be challenging. Right, right. You just do, you have to do the personal work. And that's why I've, you know, put, that's why I've even launched my Hero Mountain Summit and all of that. It's just, you have to do the work and you just make it in bite-sized pieces. And if someone's willing to the, do the work, you know, they will grow. They, yep. you will grow. <laughs> you just, there's, yes. there's no, you know, it, it depends how much depends on you, but you will grow if you commit to it. So um, that's great, a great answer. And, I, and we will dive into that uh, entrepreneur first, coach second. That was, that's an interesting thought mm -hmm. there too, I think for, uh, especially for many entrepreneurs. I didn't even know what an entrepreneur was actually when I graduated from college. There, there was no title for that. No. And, you know, no. you get shoved into these different areas and I had no idea. And, and it was like, when I looked back, I thought, I'm an entrepreneur. That's mm -hmm. why I don't, don't want to stay in the classroom. That's why I haven't yep. wanted to, I, you know, it, I wasn't happy being boxed in onto these walls. And yep. I, I had to do my own thing. That's why I have all the albums on my wall. I was, all of this stuff is just, I'm a lifetime entrepreneur. That's why I'm a creator, actually a content creator too. So that's, it just makes sense. And then helping people through that, when you get those questions, it's like, how do you get all this stuff done? Well, it's one step at a time. I can put yeah. that together for you. So yeah. So having more influence um, uh, is what we want as our, you know, an entrepreneurial um, journey. I think we want to help people, you know, with our, um, 
there, you know, with the balance of life and everything else and having more of an impact is actually mm-hmm. really what, what I'd like to do. But you also call um, having more balance. And what does that mean for you? I mean, you're an outdoorsy girl. You've got your, uh, you know, get your flannel I'm shirt on. Yes. Flannel. <laughs> in, we true, in, in true South, brand style yeah, over here. Yeah, we were just in South Lake Tahoe for my uh, one of my son's weddings. And we did buy... Um, at least a t-shirt Patagonia, but the, uh, you are an outdoor person. So what is that balance, having more balance? And is that even ever possible? And are people striving for that too much? And uh, what are some of your you, you thoughts You just hit it? all the bells. You just hit, you just ding, 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 exactly <laughs> ding, what ding, I'm ding. sitting here thinking, because <laughs> I think it balance is a tricky word because mm-hmm. I think it really puts us into that perfectionism trap. Mm-hmm. Right. Of oh, let me find the perfect balance when it really just doesn't exist. And everybody's definition uh, of balance is not only different, but I think it also ebbs and flows depending on right. where you're at in life and what season you're experiencing and where different priorities fall or different goals come into play. And so I think balance is we that that word we've heard that word forever, work life balance. And I, right. I really think it needs to just be removed from our vocabulary because I just think it's too elusive. Mm-hmm. But I also think it's important to make time for the people and the things that you love doing so that you're a well-rounded human and and not out of whack when it comes to, you know, burnout, for instance, especially in the entrepreneurial world, right. uh, you can really get out of balance. So right. yeah. uh, I yeah. don't know that balance is something we should strive for. However, we do need to be careful not to be out of it at the same time. And, you know, so for me, it's, it's about making time in to do the things that I know I enjoy and restore and kind of rejuvenate me. And, and for me, one of the ways I have, cause my, I am naturally wired to just work 90 hours a week. That is what I would do if no one else influenced my day to day. So what I went out and did without really intending to do it was marry the opposite. Okay. So, we have uh, the same, we have the same yeah. So yeah, my, same my husband my keeps, keeps me <laughs> interesting and spontaneous yes. and adventuring. And, yeah. and I, to some extent, I think I help him kind of find some discipline in life, but that's, <laughs> and so in a way I have, I am a big fan of forced accountability. It's why I go to the gym at 6am. Cause if I don't show up, my girlfriends are like, where are you? So I married forced accountability to make sure I have fun right. because while I'm wired to work all those hours, and a lot of entrepreneurs are like that, those type right. A personalities, it still isn't healthy. And what I have found in five and a half years of doing a lot of one-on-one coaching, that I need more time now, especially as I get older, to rejuvenate and recover from what I give out. We've heard that that uh, it's a meme or a say, you can't fill from an empty cup. And that's why I think that it's important to, whether you want to call it balance uh, recovery, refueling, or whatever those things are. It's important to know what gives you that restoring feeling and make intentional time for it. Intention is just the word of the day here. Uh, You know, otherwise it's really easy to slip into unhealthy habits that then just become way too routine and hard, become hard to break. Right. Uh, you have hit so many and we married the same type of man. (laughs) I'm definitely type A, he's type B. Uh, but I mean, he was a professional athlete, but he knows, I mean, he's just entertainer and, you know, the whole thing too with that. So um, that was our common denominator, which we were yep. both entertainers, but um, it just interesting. But if someone had told me that term of life balance, when I had three sons for an, um, you know, four years apart, I would have thought they were, are you crazy? It wasn't are, are possible. You, no, there is no way. Are you trying? What, life balance? What do you mean? And so, and I think a lot of people look at it that way, like that it's too much of a perfection sort of area. So I'm pretty careful with how we use that term. Every person is different, but I really encourage people to take breaks. Yes. And because I'm such a hard driver, I do work the same sort of, I would work the same sort of hours. I get up very early. Me I uh, work out very early. I get it done basically. And but I just, you know, I hit it hard. And then, you know, my mind gets a little, you know, I work better, I think, in those morning hours creatively. But you get a little tired. You just have to take, that's why I love being outdoors as well. We have, we're on an acre and a quarter. We got fruit trees on back there, you know, talking to the birds. So, you know, you, but you have to take those sort of 
breaks, uh, mental breaks and doing something else mm-hmm. to just relieve yourself. And that's every person's going to have their own sort of balance. And it's fine to work hours. It's fine to get, you know what, you can work a lot of hours, but as long as you make time for the people that are important in your life, and that you just don't burn yourself out. And the, mm-hmm. yes, the late, the older I get, gracefully growing older as we are, um, you know, you want to be able to make sure you get enough rest, all of that stuff. I used yeah. to really skimp on that. And, and, you know. I think alignment is maybe a better word than balance. Right. Because we all, that's again, something that we all have definition of, but you have the ability to to, I think, define it a little bit more than balance. And that, right. and the same comes into your career choices and that intentional next step and finding those values alignment uh, around what you hope to get out of the second half or aligning your schedule with the activities and the refueling you need and just all those kinds of things. So maybe we should go on a quest to replace work-life balance with alignment. I like it. I like it. I think of my car. Every time I run over a curb, alignment. <laughs> How many times have I done that? Think of that for like the next three years. You're yes. <laughs> well, that's, that's the first time I heard of alignment. It's like, oh, your alignment's up. Oh, darn. You know, you can't yeah, really escape it. Cost me. Cause they, yeah, because they know you did it. You know, you can bring it, they just know you did it. So, um, well, you have a unique background. So how does that make, I'm, we're always looking for that sweet spot. What's, what makes someone unique in their coaching? And I do talk to a lot of coaches. I just, I've, I really appreciate those who take on more individual coaches. I've, I've taught since the age of 13. I think we talked about that when we did our interviews. Like, okay, I don't, that's why I don't do a lot of kind of individual now. coaching. <laughs> and I've done it for so, so many years. Um, but I have a teacher's heart, so that's why I put uh, in my speaking and everything that all comes through, um, at, even as a musician, it does. But what makes you, um, how did you discover your sweet spot? What makes you a unique coach? Because you could probably coach and pick up clients in the engineering field all day long yeah, as a woman. Which, which, which I do. Yes. So in the, as a, in so I do, and in in the as a practitioner of coaching and of in okay. the career discipline, I tend to specialize in executives and engineers, STEM, mid career STEM, and executives because I have empathy and understanding uh, and the ability to translate their jargon. Simply because I came from a technical background. But what's interesting about that is I didn't identify that niche until I was actually in the field and trying to find my landing spot, which Mm -hmm. is, is, I would say the bigger picture and and why I hesitated. I was like, what order do I answer this question is I I think that especially in coaching, it's one of those a little bit of fake it till you make it situations because there is no way to go learn how to be a coach unless you do it. So again, we have that concept of like, you just sometimes have to act. And, and I think that you're, it's, it's also one of those things that you're constantly refining your own Uh, approach to the practice of coaching and even who you reach and who you want to reach, um, depending on kind of what stage in business that you're in. And so, you know, for me as a practitioner of career coaching, my kind of my unique approach is I, because I'm an engineer, I have a really analytical and algorithmic way of thinking about uh, different aspects of either career planning, job search strategy, or just these processes that a lot of times people that are also black and white thinkers are like, oh, okay, you're just going to lay this out A through F for me. And I'm like, yeah. And then I'm just going to make sure you do it and not let you fall off the wagon. So that from an approach perspective is probably a unique aspect of me as a career coach. And I'm also extremely outcomes driven. And I find, and there's nothing wrong with the following. A lot of people in the coaching space specialize in that discovery or inspiration for me, that isn't the deliverable, that's the starting point. And so I want to take that and actually see the thing come out of it based on the goals that we set. So as a, as a, as a professional in my craft, that's kind of where I fall. But what, what I have found, and this is like the new, just newer discovery in the journey, what I have found that I really have the unique ability to do is coach coaches. And so, uh, helping specifically in career coaching, career services, resume writing space, because I understand the discipline so well. And it's unique from a business development perspective. 
career coaching is a little bit unique compared to other forms of coaching because of the tactical nature of it, career under having to understand careers. And so I absolutely love helping people in that space, figure out how to find their niches, build their businesses. And because of that kind of analytical thinking, I'm able to look at somebody and say, Hey, here's how we take this idea in your brain and manifest it into some sort of like tangible thing somebody could buy. That's my favorite thing to do. So I love the business of coaching, which is probably the really unique thing about me. And I'm hoping to do more of it because that's really like where my purpose shines. Yeah. So you can mentor the mentors uh, or, you know, that sort of thing. So yeah, that's, that's wonderful as you know, you can have so much more impact that way too, because it's a, um, you know, it spreads out with, with yeah. all of that. So uh, I just think it's so great. When you mentioned empathy, um, I guess empathy, I put passion in there in, in some respects because if we were to talk about just the word empathy, even though I really empathize with people, what they're going through, but after raising sons, I'm like, well, get over it and get it done. And a lot of tough love. Yes. I mean, the same coin. They uh, like each other. And, you know, and working with people, it's kind of that way. If you don't do the work, you just, you know, mm -hmm. it's up to you. You've wasted your time. You've wasted your money. You've wasted everything else. And I hope you don't waste your life, but don't waste my time. So that sort of thing is, you know, I guess I'm lower. My husband will be laughing because he said, I think that's really low on your. On your I that, that falls very low on the. Yeah. I just, yeah enough, I just did a spiritual gifts thing. Uh -huh. And I'm pretty sure that the mercy was very yeah. low. Yeah. That I've done that same test. Mine was very low. Hospitality, all yep. of that is way up there, you know. Yep. So I'm, I'm able to entertain. I like to make people feel comfortable. Yep. But when it comes to doing work, you better do it. So excuse me. <laughs> well, I think that's where, like, to me, I can empathize with somebody's situation, but I'm not oh, going to yeah. sympathize with ex their excuses, right? right? So you're either going to set goals and work towards them, or you're going to you're just going to stay in mediocrity. Right. And, and live in limbo. And in right. 10 years go, man, I wish I would have done the thing. Right. Right. And for, for tragic um, situations, I'm definitely empathetic, but it, it, when it comes to someone saying that, you know, that they're going to do something and they don't work with intentionality or they just let stuff fall through, that's where I have a problem with it. And this, mm -hmm. you know, and with all of the excuses, just because, you know, you, hear them over and over and it's yeah. like okay well well then that's <laughs> it's up to you so yeah that was pretty funny though when you mentioned empathy I just had to bring that up so <laughs> just... I also think that it since we're on that topic I also think that's something that we could all use more of as we try to relate with each other in this world but then yeah there's a there's a there's a a rabbit hole we could go down but anyway. it's a total rabbit hole yeah. but and I think understanding your uniqueness and understanding your gifts is one of the best ways to understand diversity. Absolutely. And because when you, yeah, when you own those, you understand how you're different than everyone else. Let everybody discover their uniqueness instead of just focusing on the outside, focus on what's yeah. happening. So that is, that is true diversity. And so I don't know, we're not going to go down that rabbit hole, but that was, at least I said that. So, okay. So um market trends can be just that we're going to get to now we're going to kind of okay take a big big shift here because you know we all you know look at these I do anyway at the beginning of each year and you're looking okay so what's trending and I usually don't go with what's just what's trending I mean but AI is moving so fast mm -hmm. um a lot of the technology so I keep up with some of this I'm kind of a techie uh, not totally sort of uh, because I've worked in that field for so long with recording arts and I, I understand it but uh trends usually don't last long but do you see any that uh you think will be really here a while uh that you, that you're looking at so I think that uh, thank you for asking me this because I love to talk about I should have been a behavioral economist. I re wow. now realize what my, like what the, oh, I could have done that. Had that existed when I, when dad said, and you're good at math and science, go be an engineer. Yeah. <laughs> behavioral <laughs> economics would have been a really cool thing to have exist then because yeah. I really enjoy looking at what's trending, what the, what the data says, and then how that interacts with the labor market to kind right. of inform 
the future of our kind of our career situation. I do an, I do a career economy newsletter every month. So you hit a hot point. Ah. And I've been, I've been really thinking about this because we, we are in a, we are in a moment in time right now and a micro moment. I'm talking a three to six month moment of active shift when it comes mm-hmm. to the professional world, largely driven by a change in technology mm-hmm. triggered by quite a few things. The, the, the hiring, the 15 year hiring tear of technology that where the, 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 who's, who's, Camel's back was broken by the three-year ultra tear of hiring during COVID. Has, has the dust is settling on that, and we're in active transition on what that new normal is going to look like. And so, I feel like there's a there's a trend we're we're seeing tiny trends that are starting to emerge that I think are going to be long term. As far as technology is 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 going to be clearly the solid future of the economy. However, it's not going to be the shooting fish in a barrel job search that, that software engineers and people in that space have gotten used to. And it doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it's different. Mm -hmm. And when different means a little less activity, it makes people uncomfortable, but I, but we're going to figure that out. And, and once this active transition that we're feeling right now is over, it won't feel so heavy, I think on people who work in that space. And then we also have got actual technology trends coming. Like you mentioned AI. I'm sorry, right. it's not going anywhere. No. It's no. just mm-hmm. not. Now, let's hope it doesn't go as fast as it could if it is left untethered. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. However, it is. I mean, I'm sorry, chat GPT ain't getting shut down. No, no. I just uh, interviewed uh, a guy on machine learning and, and AI. And it's, I mean, it's fascinating how fast it's, it's, it's moving exponentially. Yeah. Oh, totally. And there's mm-hmm. a lot of really right. good beneficial things that can come out of it. There's right. also a lot of really dangerous things that mm-hmm. can come out of it if it's not closely watched, but where I know that's going to come in is I don't like the word disrupting, but for lack of a better term, that's what it's going to do. It's going to disrupt the labor market and oh, displ- yeah. displace yeah, jobs. Yeah. Is it going to fully right. replace jobs? I don't no. know. I take a more conservative, a more kind of moderate approach on that to say right. that it's not going to say, oh, there's two people there that are gone because of AI, but those yeah. two people won't be able to adapt to the career, right. the career and, and knowledge and experience needs to take a man, a manufacturing human off of a line and turn that into the engineer who's creating the ML for what is now an automated piece of the manufacturing line. So there's going to be a displacement of part of the labor market that we're going to see in the next three to seven, maybe 10 years, when that disconnect of people who can't adopt adopt and adapt are moving out, and then this new stuff is coming on. So that's definitely a trend that's staying and has remains to be seen how exactly it's going to impact us, but uh, not going anywhere. Uh, And then there's one, there's one more I'll offer that I think the, uh, the downsizing that we've seen in er in early this year in some of the really large uh, tech companies or just large companies period is going to become a more rolling effort. So I, mm. I feel like at some level, these, the, the behemoths, the big, big, big companies aren't mm-hmm. going to, it's not going to be like, Oh, I wonder if Amazon's going to do layoffs, but on a rolling kind of thing, like, huh, I wonder when the next phase is. And, ah. and that's going to be a little uncomfortable, but something that we probably are just going to have to get used to and roll with. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, it's going to be interesting. Um, I think there's always going to be a need for human always. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not going to be all robots. I think people get scared of that. Um, but there's going to be a learning curve. And that kind of brings me to what my next question for you uh, and some of your opinion, because some people are thinking, okay, I'm going to have to make a change. I, I need to keep working. What do I do? What's the first step that they do? It's not just being willing to, to learn, but where do they go? What do they do? Mm-hmm. What questions do they ask? So what, what would you tell someone? They've been, you know, doing, they've had a good, pretty good career at, at something. And all of a sudden they're, you know, they're, they're going to be lay, laid off and they need to find something else, but they don't know what to find. So mm. what is your first a uh, word of advice for them. How do they start? And I want to go back and agree with you that I, we're never, there will always be a human element as long right. as there are humans on this earth. Exactly. Humans still matter. Hashtag humans still matter. I keep yes. putting it on all my LinkedIn posts. <laughs> I like but, it. And, and, and all of these things will still require human input. 
Mm-hmm. Now that might become in, in a decreasing fashion as the technology becomes more and more trained. However, it will always require human human input. So if you're changing careers, the first thing I think you have to do is be really honest with yourself about whether or not you are in any position to go become a machine learning engineer, right? right. Because just most people aren't going to make that kind of career change. Right. Uh, however, you could look at, okay, where could I take my experience and putting in, put it into a more innovative, forward thinking or emerging type environment. For instance, if you're a content creator and you work for uh, a digital agency, you could go be a content creator for a machine learning company or an AI company or even a software company. So it's it's thinking about your skills, ex- experience and knowledge. Well, I'll give you my Venn diagram spiel because this is how I think about, this is the, the easiest way and it's creating a visual on something that's audio. So roll with me, everybody. But what I encourage you to do is if you are in a place you don't like, you're probably in the overlap of a Venn diagram because I think about everybody's professional marketabilities having two circles on a Venn diagram. One is your functional skill set, skills, experience, and knowledge, and how you apply them. I'm a content creator. I'm a salesperson. The I am a what? Your title, the box you fit into. The other circle is your industry or subject matter knowledge, technology, music, film and production, creative arts, whatever the space in which you perform is. So right now you're most marketable where they overlap, but most career changers or shifters even don't want to be in that overlap. So your next best option is to root one circle of your Venn diagram to pivot the other. Because if you try to change both things at once, you are out in space with no tether back to the ship Mm -hmm. and you're just floating around out there and it becomes really hard to take transferable skills and have leverage to find a new role without potentially having to go back down the ladder too far than most mid-career people want to go. So what I encourage you to do, I actually have a di- I have a, I have a printable diagram for this. It's in the freebies on careervendors.com okay. where you can actually write down like, okay, here's my functional skill set, And that could either be titles or that could be things you're good at. You know, if you're in operations, you're probably also good at finance and you're probably also good at project management. And you can make these little bullets and then you can say, okay, well, where does that, where does the industry knowledge apply and which one do I want to preference first? Do I want to change industries first? Or do I really want out of this job function? If you want out of the job function, use your existing company or the industry to make that pivot. It right. might need to be a two-step process. It is unrealistic to jump the entire chasm in one fell swoop. And it's okay not to do that. Right, right. And when you mentioned, because I have something called the core common denominator, we, we look at skills and we look at experience and what you love to do. And part of that is personality. But um, you really look realistically at what your skills are. And a lot of what you love, end up loving to do, the passion for is a lot of times what work you've ended up, you've, you, some of your work is in that passion. There has mm-hmm. to be at least a little bit of it. And uh, you may not be totally there, but, but a little bit of, but if you really analyze what skill set that you have and what competencies you have, you know, like your competency bank, that's what I call it. And, and yep. you know, you can, you can bank on that actually, and to see where that can apply. I think that's very good advice. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll make sure people know, I do write an article with every single one of, um, and not every interview, but most interviews, I uh, monthly ones that I do, I write an article. There will be an article with this, but I always put the links in there. So you'll be oh, able cool. to get a hold of. We'll give you uh, all the yes, resources. Yes, yes. So I think that's really great to, to have. So, well, that's um, wonderful to have that first step. And it's nice yeah. that you have that diagram that would be available. I will encourage people to go online and get that diagram and uh, to really analyze a little bit of this because this is common for everybody. Uh, yes. Eventually uh, there's change ahead. So uh, a lot of people have a hard time with change, with transition. It's almost like having a baby. I keep going back to that, but once you go through that transition, it's painful, you know, but there is reward uh, at the end, but any sort of transition um through that time, it's, it's uncomfortable. It needs to be over. It It needs to be over. Yeah. But we also know growth doesn't exist in your comfort zone. It doesn't happen unless you have, unless you go through change. And if you're able to 
from a mindset perspective, embrace it a little yes. bit more. Yes. It ends up, you meet it with less resistance and it's actually easier. We are the ones that usually make going through change hard right. because we want to fight it. Right. And the other thing I'll offer as an, another kind of just very practical action you can take if you're in, if you're, if you're somewhere you don't want to be, uh, a couple prompts I would, I will ask people is what's working and what is not working. And right. a lot of times what isn't working becomes a just as useful as an answer or, or what is missing is another one. Those Mm -hmm. two kind of uh, scarcity questions Mm -hmm. can actually become really useful to then flipping the equation and saying, okay, well, if this is missing, what's going to fill it. And so a lot of times people will say to me, they're like, I feel like I just, I know everything I don't want and nothing that I do. And I'm like, okay, at least we can start with it. Cause if you have apathy and you can't even figure out what you don't like, then where the heck are you? So that's a really good thing to think about. A core values exercise is also a really good thing to think about because then you know what alignment looks like if and when you find it. And don't be afraid to talk to people is another right. really great thing that I think a lot of people don't want to do because we are just like so hyper-connected, unconnected at the same time that it's like, right. oh, they might think I'm bothering them or I want something. But in general, if you find somebody who who responds to the, hey, I would love to get some info about your career, they understand it and it will come full circle. But a lot of times those kinds of conversations can help you feel a little bit closer and get a little bit more of a tangible perspective on what a career or an industry or even a company looks like than you can get from just theorizing. Right. Great advice. Um, and uh, it's very much in line of what uh, I uh, I encourage people to do. So I just love that you have uh, verbalized that so well and getting you know, getting the in, input. I'm huge on core values. Uh, they really affect your purpose and you should stop and evaluate those every now and then. Anyway, um, I, I do pretty much every year. And as I go through goals and you want to see what you stand for, where you want to be and uh, what you want your life to be like. So I think mean, it's just a really important part. I wrote a whole appendix section in my book, uh, Stop Circling, all about core values because i, I a great way to stop circling. It is totally a great way, but I encourage through, even through all of the steps, I said, you know, probably one of the most important things you can do first is define those values. And then as you go through this, and we have all sorts of tools in there, but, but it's, it's a really important um, aspect of this to, to be able to stop and do so. Well, and this has just been such a delightful, again, it went so fast, but I would like you to, um, if there was one thing you want to encourage everyone um, to take away from this, I don't. It's hard to come up with one thing, but if you can encourage people in one specific way uh, at the end of this, uh, what would you say? Don't accept mediocre. Ah, okay. and I'll, I'll give you a little reason of why I say that. Uh, um, because in a way that is a little bit more of a woo woo piece of advice than I usually give because I'm just so practical, tactical, tactical action oriented, but that the, the realization that we accept mediocrity way too much in this society really became a trigger for change in my life. And then without really knowing it became the foundation of how I carry out my purpose and, and calling in this world. And I, and and so what I, if, if something is not right, or you're, you have that feeling inside that you're like, you know, there's more, or I just could do something different, or I could have better alignment, lean into that because your intuition is telling you something. And I think we quiet it too often and just take the status quo as how we're supposed to live. You don't have to live according to how society tells you you're supposed to, you can define the life you want to have. And you, there is a way I know, regardless of what golden handcuffs you have, what responsibilities you have, whatever excuses you can apply to it, there is a way to align those goals. And even a little bit of like some of that dreamy stuff with a practical solution that is achievable and it's out there for you. Take a step to find it. That is great advice. And uh, don't accept mediocrity uh, or mediocre. Um, also, just don't take shortcuts that will, you know, it'll, it'll cut, they'll cut you off. So, um, and that's, that's not to say that you can't aim for uh, a job well done or, you know, but 
you know, done is better than perfect too. So that perfectionism, but that mediocrity, we all know what that is. And yeah. uh, we can all, we all know. In, there's it's a four letter F word that women know really well. Yeah, very, fine. very much. Yeah. Oh, fine. I'm oh yeah, fine. I'm fine. Yeah, yeah if, right. if your answer to I'm uh, is fine to everything, you're living a mediocre life. Yeah, yeah. Very Sorry, good one. newsflash. I like I like that. That'd be a good title. So. I feel like that's a LinkedIn post for next week. <laughs> yes, it will be. That will be. We'll we'll expect that one. So, well, Angie, how can uh, you mentioned it earlier? But how can everyone contact you and uh, get a hold of you and see what you're doing? Sure. Uh, Careerbenders.com. Careerbenders with an S on the end. Uh, is kind of the epicenter of everything. So it's the social handles for everything. It's the website that leads you to everywhere. And then my kind of platform of authority is LinkedIn. So if uh, if you would like to follow along and have me clog up your newsfeed along with Deborah, <laughs> I see hers and mine every day. Uh, find me find me there as well, and you know would love to support you if if you feel like you're at that point of change and and want to lean in. Oh, delightful. Thank you so much. And again, for all of our listeners, there will be an article that's out on this and make sure that you get it. Uh, If you're on my newsletter, I know inboxes are just so full. I have a a double opt in. I don't automatically add people, but it is goalsforyourlife.com forward slash newsletter. Just easy goalsforyourlife.com forward slash newsletter. You can also get a hold of me at Deborah Johnson speaker, DJ works music. Everyone loves the music. So, but my newsletter, the weekly ones, I do have a weekly newsletter on LinkedIn, but it doesn't have all the other goodies. So uh, you'll get music, you'll get uh, videos, you'll get other things that are in my uh, weekly uh, newsletter and of course the podcast. So thank you again for being with us today, Angie. This has been great. And thank you everyone for listening and hanging on. And I look forward to being with you again next time. So bye-bye for now. Thank you for joining us. It is because of our wonderful listeners like you that we keep going strong week after week. We'd love it if you'd share and follow us to not miss a single show and even write a review. You can also find all of our articles, products, and links at womenathalftime.com.